uh, as uh, we have mentioned uh, from today onwards, uh, we'll be covering uh, both uh, your uh, polity governance paper as well as uh, Indian administration paper. It will be, as I said, in your general studies, polity governance and constitution, uh, mostly the theoretical aspects are discussed, but UPSC is not focusing on theoretical aspects. They will not ask you what is Article 41 or Article 42. They are focusing mostly on uh, current analytical aspects. They are focusing on this current analytical uh, aspects. So we will be discussing uh, all of them as part of our classes. Not only the theoretical aspects, but also administrative, governance, political, economic and uh, social aspects. That is what uh, we will be doing. So to understand about all those things, what is required is, uh, you know, we must understand uh, what happened in the past to understand about what is happening in the present so that we can predict the future also. Because uh, if you look at the present political system of India, the administrative system of India present, it is nothing but uh, a continuation of uh, what happened in the past, especially from the British times, especially from the British times. And uh, we have to look at uh, what happened during the British times and what kind of changes we have made after uh, uh, after the uh, British rule. Did we make any real changes or not? Or uh, you know, are we continuing with only the political and administrative system that were there during the British times? We have to make an analysis out of it and then we will see you know, what needs to be done in the present circumstances. What is very important is uh, we must understand why the Britishers had created those structures, what was the objective and uh, whether those structures have been efficient or not and uh, what uh, you know, is the impact of those structures. That is what uh, we should be looking at and to understand what happened in the British times, we must uh, go a little bit back also to what happened during the Mughal times. That also we should be looking at. Let us see today what happened in those times so that uh, we can come to the present and discuss about uh, our constitution and other aspects of uh, you know, our polity and governance as well as administration. Our polity and governance as well as administration. So let us see. So if you look at, uh, you know, let us go back a little bit uh, into pages of history and let us look at uh, what happened in the you know, 17th and 18th centuries in India. If you look at uh, in 17th century and 18th century, India was uh, the richest country in the world. It was the richest country in the world, India. Akbar, at that point of time, even also, even now also, sometime back, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, some journal in America has carried out uh, the list of uh, top 10 rich men in the world, richest person in the world, right from, uh, you know, 5,000 years back till now and Akbar was uh, there as part of those top 10 uh, richest persons in the world by calculating uh, the income at that point of time and extrapolating it to the present day prices. So Indian uh, Empire at that point of time, you know the Mughal Empire was uh, the most powerful empire in the world at that point of time and it was the most prosperous also. That is the reason why the Britishers, what do they do whenever they compare the Victorian age? The Victorian age is always compared to the golden age of uh, Mughals, especially Akbar. So, uh, uh, why India was called the richest country in the world at that point of time? You know, our contribution to global trade and global GDP was around 30 percent. India's contribution to global trade and global GDP was around 30 percent. Now, we say that America is the superpower. Its contribution is around 25 percent, between 20 and 25 percent. India's contribution was more than 30 percent at that point of time. India along with China were uh, uh, the, the most powerful nations uh, in the uh, 17th, 18th and even 19th centuries also. They were the most powerful nations. India, China's contribution was also almost similar at that point of time, slightly less than India. That is the reason why when you study international relations also, what do we say about uh, when we talk about Indo-China relations? 
the objective of inter channel relations is uh, to bring back the, the 19th century not we should transform a 21st century into 19th century because in 19th century india and china combined together had a 60% of trade and uh, output now that is what they are saying of course in 21st century when you talk about it 58% china and 2% india no problem to bring back the 19th century era that is what at present so coming back here when india was the most prosperous country in the world at that point of time obviously india attracted the attention of the rest of the world it has attracted the attention of the rest of the world and the rest of the world wanted to come to india and to trade with india why because they wanted to prosper by trading with india and if you look at these european countries they are all the small small uh, countries uk small island and uh, rest of the european countries and the conditions at that point of time if you look at uh, 17th and 18th centuries the conditions were not really good in the sense that uh, uh, you know there was no electricity there were no uh, you know better transportation and communication facilities so for european countries to survive what they needed was they must focus on trade you know that is the reason why from feudalism feudalism if you study in world history you know the world moved had moved away towards what we called uh, mercantilism mercantilism trade used to be the engine of growth what do they do they buy goods from one country and sell it in other countries trade was the engine of growth and if you look at the united kingdom again at that point of time it was a small island agriculture was also not there for agriculture you require a good climatic conditions there was no agriculture so what did united kingdom do at that point of time they had developed being a, a, you know an island nation they had no option but to focus on uh, the overseas trade focus on that is the reason why uk developed what we call uh, ship building industries they focus on uh, in a uh, uh, this building ships big big ships were uh, vessels and ships were uh, constructed so that they could trade overseas overseas and slowly the merchants from uk traveled to other countries around the world the businessmen and uh, they started uh, uh, doing a uh, Uh, you know uh, the trade with other countries and uh, they saw the political conditions in those countries and uh, they were uh, they divided the people in those countries and they started ruling those countries so divide and rule if you happen to see today's uh, in the newspaper there was an article about uh, what uk had done in the past had come back to ha- haunt them at the present uk itself is now divided you know it is anything but united kingdom it is anything but united kingdom because of uh, the problems related to brexit and uh, other things the country is fully divided multi ethnic multi racial country so coming back uh, in those days you know uh, these merchants they traveled over to this for trade and uh, what did they do they started exploiting the natives and uh, they started controlling the native population which resulted in uh, what we call uh, american revolution also when the natives of america revolted against the british uh, imperialist traders that resulted in american revolution the question that was asked in your world history also two years back so coming back here you know obviously you know uh, there is ice was set on india also because of uh, the kind of diversity that india had at that point of time and uh, uh, the problem with india was that uh, india was not a single country even the india was the most prosperous nation in the world china was a, a single country but india was not india was not a single country so india was divided into so many kingdoms so many uh, you know empires and obviously it is easy because the country is so badly divided the sense of nationhood was never there at that point of time when the traders from european countries came here and initially they restricted themselves to trade and what did they do to protect their uh, Uh, trading centers they started constructing forts they started constructing forts and they also started developing their own army they also had their own army the portuguese the dutch the french and the britishers they started developing their own army and the difference was that their army was much more professional than the local king, local kings and uh, other uh, rulers so what did they do 
they use their army they provide the services of their army to the local kings in the fight between uh, uh, these uh, kings slowly they occupied you know uh, various uh, territories of the country and they had fight among themselves they fought among themselves the british the french the dutch and the portuguese finally the british was emerged as victorious the asian air company emerged as victorious in all those battles the rest of uh, the rest of all these uh, uh, you know uh, uh, foreign powers were thrown out of the country and the british uh, had a complete monopoly so this is what uh, happened at that point of time and what was the reason why the british could occupy the entire country so easily as we mentioned uh, you know after 1707 aurangzeb died and from 1707 to 1757 the country witnessed a lot of uh, political instability because uh, the later moguls who came to power never had uh, the kind of aura or uh, the kind of uh, power that earlier moguls had exercised mogal emperor used to command a lot of respect and fear but the later moguls did not have that kind of personalities another reason is that uh, if you look at the mogal empire the their uh, strength also had turned out to be their basic weakness what were the strength of the mogal empire centralized despotism that is what we say centralized despotism the emperor had uh, all uh, the powers emperor he had uh, all the powers he was a despot dictator centralized and all these powers were centralized in the hands of uh, a single person as long as the emperor was strong empire was stable as long as the emperor was strong empire was stable so what happened uh, aurangzeb if you look at aurangzeb uh, what did he do he fought so many battles in uh, different places that is what you study in history also it the what was the result uh, what was the uh, basic reason for the fall of mogal empire what you call it as a deccan ulcer era he fought so many battles in uh, the south of uh, the country deccan and uh, he had spent uh, so much amount of money on the one hand he was fighting the uh, uh, you know uh, deccan in hyderabad and then uh, on the other hand he was fighting the marathas and then he was fighting the rajputs he was fighting uh, with uh, uh, these six also almost everywhere he was fighting was he wanted to expand the boundaries of his uh, kingdom and during, and during uh, uh, the tenure of aurangzeb era uh, uh, the mughal empire reached its zenith uh, it uh, reached its you uh, know uh, maximum levels you know it extended from afghanistan till myanmar and uh, from kashmir till uh, tamil nadu it has extended but the problem is that uh, with uh, centralized despotism and with uh, absence of uh, a better governing systems better governance systems obviously it was a recipe for a disaster when he had so fought so many wars there was uh, no income within the treasury in those days the basic source of income for any government was agricultural income tax only and agriculture was mostly on a sustenance basis there were not uh, much of uh, technology that was used in agriculture at that point of time it was only sustenance agriculture so obviously for all these reasons uh, what happened was uh, era, the revenues of the mughal empire had come down drastically as we keep on saying era you know finances are the life blood of any organization and if you look at uh, the army at that point of time if you look at army at that point of time our uh, the army of uh, these uh, uh, kings and emperors they never had any kind of loyalties in the sense that uh, they were not loyal to the emperor or the king they would only work for those people who are willing to pay them salaries on a regular basis their loyalty is only towards money and but not towards any in a king or emperor so when uh, uh, the Uh, mughal emperors after aurangzeb could not pay the salaries on time and obviously army had shifted their loyalties they were willing to work for any any king uh, any other institution which is willing to pay them salaries that is what uh, that is where the britishers had scored over other uh, you know kingdoms in india 
in most of uh, uh, these uh, princely states and uh, kingdoms, what happened? Army was never paid regular salaries. On the other hand, what they were asked? They were asked to collect taxes from the people. Obviously, this is uh, not going to succeed, and it resulted in a uh, in uh, army committing so many atrocities. People also suffered the most. On the other hand, what did the Britishers do? East India Company. What is the most important reason why East India Company could occupy such a vast uh, continent in a in such a very easy manner? The most important reason why they could occupy was that their army was completely professional. British, uh, the East India Company, they always paid the uh, salaries uh, on time. That uh, resulted in uh, extreme loyalty of the soldiers. They were willing to sacrifice their life for the sake of uh, uh, for the sake of their kingdoms, for the sake of their uh, company. And if you look at uh, this Battle of Plassey, you know what happened there. On the one side, we had uh, the Nawabs, the Bengal Nawab. On the other side, the East India Company forces. And what were their respective strengths? You know, Nawab had around 25,000 soldiers fighting, and uh, East India Company had around 1,500 soldiers. 1500 army men defeated 25,000 soldiers in exactly two hours time. In army, in a, what really does not matter is the size, the professionalism of the army. It was over in two, three hours. And uh, the Bengal Nawab, of course, there was a mutiny within the army also. In a, uh, most of the army, they did not participate in the war. You must be knowing all these things. Okay. And then what happened is that at that point of time, on the day when the battle took place, it was raining. It was raining, unfortunately for the Bengal Nawab. It was raining. And uh, the French had given Bengal Nawab uh, this artillery. And uh, if it was not raining at that point of time, India's history would have been completely different. That is what we say fate. You know, since uh, it was raining, the Bengal Nawab could not use the French artillery, the heavy guns. He could not use them. And uh, his army was defeated within no time. Had it not rained on that particular day, it could have been different. East India Company forces would have been defeated. India would not have come under the British rule. It's only about these things. The same thing happened in the third battle of Panipat also. The Amasha Abdali and Marathas era. The Marathas were almost winning the, the battle. Unfortunately, on the day, the battle, the third battle took place in the month of January, Panipat, you know, from 100 kilometers from Delhi. And Marathas were fighting from the other side, from the western side. And the uh, uh, horses that they were riding, you know, there was, uh, in the month of January, there was unusual sun in Delhi and in the, all these places in North India. January is one of the coldest uh, months. On that day, there was a, a very sharp sun. It blinded uh, the horses. They could not run. And uh, in between Abdali's forces, they came and uh, you know, they conquered the army. Had it not there be, had there not been any in any uh, you know sun on that particular day, again India's history would have been completely different. Because Marathas, they have they had occupied almost. Uh, the whole of the central India and North India. They marched towards Delhi. They put uh, the uh, in a Mughal uh, in a emperor in a, and then they were ruling the whole of the country, Marathas. And unfortunately, on that particular day, in a, it was bright sunshine. That is the reason why in Maratha language, you know, in, uh, in Maharashtra, the, the language, there were old sayings also. It was uh, the sun that blinded uh, Marathas. In a, so coming back here, history is full of uh, these kind of uh, surprises. Our history is full of. It was the nature that re really defeated Indians at that point of time. If uh, had uh, you know Maratha succeeded there, had uh, defeated Ahmad Shah Abdali in the third battle of Panipat, Britishers would never have dared to raise their head. And on the other hand, at the same time, almost at the same time, in the battle of Plassey, you know they defeated the Bengal Nawab. So coming back here, East India Company was basically a trading company. They came to India for trading purposes. Due to the political stability in the country, 
due to fight uh, among uh, these uh, trading powers suddenly they found themselves in a peculiar situation what was that peculiar situation they found themselves uh, ruling a vast territory of land which is a uh, you know much much uh, larger than their own country much much larger than their own country for example the nizam province province the area of nizam province is much uh, larger than the entire united kingdom the bengal province at least three four times than the whole of united kingdom and when they occupied the bengal province what is this bengal province consisted of it consisted of the present day west bengal bihar assam orissa bangladesh you can imagine when they occupied this bengal province they suddenly found themselves uh, with uh, asking the question how to administer such a huge province how to rule such huge province and uh, we must remember that uh, they were only traders east india company was a company that was registered in london stock exchange at that point of time and uh, those who came to india as a traders those who came to india as a traders there were very few englishmen a few thousands of englishmen that is what they had come they were accountable to their you know board of directors in london you must show profits if you are a stock holding company you are accountable to your shareholders in london and they had to show profits regularly they had to show profits otherwise the stock prices will fall the company can get liquidated also so they had to show profits and then what happened was uh, these uh, people who are in india they tasted political power from being a trading community they had become the masters and they did not want to lose uh, this opportunity to expand the size of the east india company the size of their kingdom and of course fighting wars at any point of time is a costly affair they needed finances also they needed money to fight all these wars initially it was they occupied bengal province then they went to southern provinces from their marathas then they were fighting wars in afghanistan and along with uh, uh, there is a six also so when they were fighting so many wars almost simultaneously they needed huge amounts of money they needed huge amount of money and the amount of revenue they were getting is only mostly you know land revenues at that point of time the major source of revenue was land revenue and they would impose restrictions on uh, uh, foreign trade uh, because of which uh, the french the dutch and the portuguese had left the country the french went eastwards and the dutch also went eastwards the portuguese had completely left except one or two you know places in india they had completely left so when asian company gained complete monopoly over the trade as well as uh, uh, got the opportunity to rule the country that was when uh, you know they had decided to come out with uh, changes in uh, administrative systems to suit to the conditions in india from 1757 1764 this battle of baksar was 1764 so from 1764 till 1947 from 1764 till 1947 era uh, east india company came out with uh, an east india company initially and uh, the british government later came out with uh, so many innovations in administration and uh, those innovations which they had introduced according to the conditions prevailing in india had become the basis of governance after independence that is the reason why we should look at what happened at that point of time all those innovations and all those uh, uh, you know changes that had made from 1757 till 1857 it was the company's rule and from 1857 till 1947 it was the british government directly ruling the country so what were the changes and how those changes had impacted the present day indian administration that is what 
we will try to see now how they had impacted. So if you look at it uh, after uh, they occupied uh, after they occupied the, this uh, Bengal province initially they introduced uh, in a GL rule diarchy in Bengal province. The Bengal Nawab was made responsible for uh, maintenance of law and order and other uh, other functions taking care of the welfare of the people whereas the British has kept with themselves revenue generating powers collection of taxes well were with the Britishers whereas the Nawab had all the responsibilities Britishers had all the powers they had all the powers Nawab did not Nawab cannot spend a single rupee because he did not have any money also Britishers collected all the revenues and kept the revenues with themselves whereas the Nawab was given the responsibility of ensuring law and order and the welfare of the people. Obviously this kind of arrangement cannot succeed. This kind of arrangement can never succeed. As we always study, authority and responsibility should always go together. One of the important principles of governance is that authority and should, uh, responsibility should always go together. A person who has responsibility must also have the authority. Obviously this arrangement uh, was not successful. It was not successful. Of course, the same arrangement was repeated, you know, after uh, 250 years. UPA government. Again, foreign powers. History repeats. Manmohan Singh was the Prime Minister. Sonia Gandhi, Italian power. From Britishers to Italians. Okay. She had all the power and Manmohan Singh had all the responsibility. What is the outcome? 2014 elections, Congress party 44 seats. When you don't uh, follow the principles of governance, that is what exactly happens. And uh, and for how long uh, this uh, you know, arrangement lasted, the arrangement between the Bengal Nawab and the East India Company? How many years? When did Battle of Plaza take place? 1750? Seven and Battle of Baxa, 64. Seven years it had lasted, and UP arrangement lasted. UP arrangement lasted for ten years. That is what happens. It cannot be more than that. It lasted for ten years because Manmohan Singh cannot revolt and will not revolt. Cannot think of revolting also. It is the people who have revolted, not Manmohan Singh. Okay, people who have revolted against this kind of arrangement at that point of time. Bengal Nawab had some kind of self-esteem. I am not saying that Manmohan Singh does not have it. Self-esteem. To have it, you should know what it is. What is it also? Manmohan Singh did not know what is self-esteem also. In uh, 1987, in, uh, Manmohan Singh was uh, the Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission. And Rajiv Gandhi was the Prime Minister. Rajiv Gandhi in a press conference, he called the Planning Commission members a bunch of jokers. Rest of all the planning commission members resigned, but not Manmohan Singh. Okay. So Manmohan Singh is made up of a thick skin. In a, in a. See, obviously in politics, if you talk about self-esteem, what happens? You will not be able to achieve greater heights. That is what. We will talk about all these people as we proceed. In a, why this uh, in a administration and polity and uh, these things are very, very interesting is because we will talk about all these personalities. We will talk about Yavala Nehru. We restrict ourselves only to governance issues, not his private affairs. If we have to talk about his private affairs, we will have to continue classes for at least two, three years. Okay. So we will restrict ourselves. Similarly, same is the case with Indira Gandhi. Okay. We will only talk about you know, what was the problem with her government, not with her personal life. Again, if we have to discuss it, it will take a lot of time for us. So coming back, there is nothing to talk about Rahul Gandhi. Okay. Okay. Don't expect me. To, uh, don't expect to talk about Rahul Gandhi. Either. So coming back here, you know what happened was that uh, so the Bengal Nawab revolted and the uh, Britishers, uh, you know, ended this arrangement uh, in Bengal province. Suddenly they found themselves ruling such a vast territory of land, 
and on the other hand this court of uh, uh, a board of control that was there in london they were demanding accountability from this uh, board of directors in india of east india company they were saying that to show the profits and uh, this board of directors uh, were clearly told that uh, they should not fight any wars east india company should re always remain a trading company and they should not uh, have any political ambitions that is what they were clearly informed why because the profits were coming down because of the wars that were fought by east india company so the board of directors who were staying in india at that point of time they were uh, they had already tasted political power they did not to want uh, to stop fighting the wars they had to come out with something new to increase their revenues so that they could show profits to their you know bosses sitting in london they could show profits and that is the reason why they introduced as we have said so many changes you cannot call them as reforms they introduced so many changes in the bengal province what they have done they had introduced zamindari system they had introduced zamindari system what is this zamindari system zamindari system what is it jami means land zamindari means owner so normally you know in those days the farmer was the owner of the land farmer was the owner of the land so what did uh, the british east india company do they had uh, grouped a number of villages around 50 20 villages 30 40 villages they were grouped together they had given this responsibility of collecting revenue collecting revenue from these villages to a person they said that you must collect uh, revenues land revenues to a person that person was called zamindar he was a collection agent of east india company and the land revenue was fixed by the directors of the company so that they get a fixed income every year irrespective of whether whether the farmers were producing it or not why because there was lot of pressure on the board of directors in uh, india to show india to show profits so what they have done as part of uh, this uh, system zamindari system the entire province of bengal was divided into small small units of uh, 30 40 villages and how did they divide they conducted a scientific survey regarding the fertility of the soil regarding uh, Uh, the output of uh, that particular uh, you know land on the basis of that they fixed uh, the land revenues whether it is uh, the uh, british rule or the you know uh, this mughal rule the land revenue was only the source of revenue for the governments agricultural income tax land revenue it is used to vary between 1/4 to 1/3 that means 25% to 33% of the output in those days there was no gst otherwise uh, britishers would have consulted uh, the gst council also okay so the only source of revenue was 25% to 33% and britishers wanted to maximize the revenue so that is the reason why you know they had divided them the bengal province was divided into what we call them as a revenue districts the entire province was divided into revenue districts on the basis of the revenue potential of that particular area it was divided into revenue districts on the basis of the revenue potential and they had appointed one person to collect the revenue and that person was called the collector of revenue that person was called the collector of revenue what we call them as at present the district collector the office of district collector had its origins 
in the East India Company. Collector means collector of revenue. Collector of revenue. What we call them as the district collector. So, and this district collector would appoint Jamindars. And these Jamindars were given the responsibility to collect the revenue on behalf of the East India Company. And the revenue will be fixed by the East India Company. How much amount of revenue they must be collecting? It is fixed by the East India Company on the basis of, as we have said, the scientific survey done by the East India Company officials. And for collecting this revenue, the Jamindar was given a certain you know, percentage of profits. For example, you know, 12 13th of the revenue will be going to the East India Company and 1 13th will be going to the Jamindar for collecting the revenue. For collecting the revenue. Jamindar would be getting around 1 13th. Means what is the percentage? Around 8%? Around 7.5 to 8%. Okay. That is what the Jamindar would be getting. And what is the arrangement here? Jamindar, the amount of revenue he has to collect is fixed. For example, from the 40 villages that are under his control, he should be paying the East India Company around, say, 1 lakh rupees. 1 lakh rupees. He should be paying 1 lakh rupees. Irrespective of whether that particular year the output is there or not. For example, in case of a drought or a famine situation, farmers won't be able to pay the taxes. Farmers won't be able to pay the taxes because there is no output. Farmers won't be able to pay. Whether the farmers are paying or not, whether the farmers are paying the tax or not, Jamindar must pay the tax. Every year, it is the responsibility of the Jamindar to pay the taxes to the East India Company, irrespective of whether farmers are paying it or not. And what happened? This East India Company had given powers to these Jamindars to confiscate the land of those farmers who do not pay the revenues and pay taxes on behalf of those farmers. Farmers can have can have ownership's rights over the land only for as long as they paid the taxes regularly. Under normal monsoon conditions, they would pay the taxes. The problems would come up only, they would come up only when, only when under a drought and famine conditions. What happened because of this? Over a period of time, Jamindas had a confiscated the entire land of farmers. Farmers had become tillers own, in their own land. In their own land. That is how this Jamindari system had become so exploitative in nature. It had become so exploitative in nature. And uh, uh, that is the reason why if you look at the present agriculture in India, you know, almost uh, you know, 89 percent of farmers own less than 2% of land and 2% of farmers own 90% of land because of this kind of exploitative land revenue system that were introduced by the Britishers. So this is what happened. So this is what the Britishers had done to maximize their revenues and slowly they were expected to perform other functions. So the British, as long as the British rule was there in India, British rule had two important objectives. It had two important objectives. What were the objectives of the British rule? To maximize revenues. That is what a colony is supposed to do. A colony is supposed to work for the interests of the imperial state. A colony is supposed to work for the interests of the imperial state. India was a colony of the Britishers. India did not have any independent existence. So, to maximize revenues for the British Empire, that is what they were expected to do. So, the 
British administration, colonial administration in India had uh, this important objective. Second one is to continue British rule in India for as long as possible, almost forever. To continue British rule in India. for as long as possible. Why? Because Britishers, Britishers uh, never wanted to lose control over the India. India was the golden you know, duck for the Britishers. So they did not, know, they never wanted. Even after Second World War was over, Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of UK at that point of time, never wanted to give freedom to India. A true imperialist. He said that uh, even if we get destroyed, we should not lose control over uh, our colonies. Churchill. That is the reason why in, uh, uh, when Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister during the Second World War, he was doing so many things except uh, assuring the Indians that after the Second World War, India would be getting freedom. And uh, India got freedom because uh, after the war was over, Britishers had defeated Conservative Party and voted for Labour Party. Attlee became the Prime Minister. He was always in favour of giving freedom to the country. India got freedom. So, uh, these two were the important objectives of uh, the British rule in India. One, you know, to maximise the revenues and uh, second, to continue British rule in India for as long as possible. So whatever uh, the changes they had introduced in India, the changes they had introduced in India were only to achieve these objectives. To achieve these objectives. So what did the Britishers do? What kind of changes they had introduced? Let us see. What did they introduce? Era. From 1773 onwards, from 1773 onwards, they had uh, passed the regulating acts, the British Parliament passed the regulating acts. Uh, regulating acts after every 20 years. They had passed the regulating acts after every 20 years. So, 1773, 1793, then 1813, 1833, and finally 1853. After every 20 years, the British Parliament had passed the regulating acts. After every 20 years, it had passed the regulating acts. After every 20 years. What was the objective of uh, these regulating acts to control the activities of East India Company? To control the activities of uh, East India Company. You must remember that in your Plains examination, at least every year, two, three questions will be about uh, these regulating acts. They keep on asking every year. Nowadays, uh, the last this year, uh, they have asked only one question, I think. Uh, Otherwise, every year they will ask about 2-3 questions from these uh, regulating acts. So, it had passed uh, these regulating acts from uh, 1773 till 1853. Uh, then, 1857, the war took place and from 1858 onwards, uh, the eight, after the 1857 war, Ishida Company's uh, political power had come to an end. India went directly into the hands of the British crown, from the British crown. From 1858 onwards, it was the British parliament that was passing legislations for India. After that, 1861, Indian Council Act was passed. 1861, Indian Council Act was passed. Then, uh, after that, 1892, What is it? Indian Council Act. One more Indian Council Act was passed, 1892. Then, 
19 not 9 what are they 19 not 9 what were they called more like into reforms not you know, not even reform changes only 1909 then 1919 government of india act 1919 government of india act and later 1935 government of india act 1935 government of india act and finally last but not the least 1947 Indian Independence Act Indian Independence Act was passed by the British Parliament finally the Indian Independence Act was passed by the British Parliament the content of all these legislations content of all these legislations will be part of your uh, prelims polity it will be part of your prelims polity the content of all these legislations from uh, the main perspective especially both uh, our Indian administration and political governors from main perspective what we will be looking at is uh, the analysis of British rule in India how it has changed what is the impact of British rule on Indian administration let us try, try to look at these things what is the impact of British rule why because as I said unless we understand how the British had created the institutions and used all these institutions we cannot understand what is happening in India at this point of time so where do we see the impact of British rule what are the things that they had introduced in India what did they introduce let us see first they introduced the concept of rule of law first they introduced the uh, impact of British rule impact of British rule on Indian administration impact of British rule on Indian administration first as we are saying uh, first what they had done they introduced the concept of uh, rule of law then they introduced the independent judiciary independent judiciary third they introduced federal form of government federal form of government four they introduced uh, the fourth they introduced uh, parliamentary democracy parliamentary democracy fifth they introduced uh, the civil services which we have at this point of time civil services they introduced civil services next they also introduced the present district administration we have district administration next local self governments local self governments lord ripon we call him as the father of local self governments in india next they also introduce secretariat administration they also introduce secretariat administration secretariat administration what we have at present the cabinet secretary central secretariat and uh, uh, pmo all those um, are nothing but uh, the replicas of uh, the british administration next they also introduced the budgets and other financial systems budgets 
budgets and other financial systems for example public accounts committee auditing cag all of them you know were part of a british administration they introduced these things budget and other a uh, the financial systems they introduced so this is what uh, the britishers uh, had done in their 200 years rule in india you must remember that uh, when the britishers had uh, introduced all these things their objective uh, was not to maximize uh, welfare of uh, people what was their objective to maximize the revenues second second to continue british rule in india almost uh, on a permanent basis so this is what uh, they have done uh, let us see all these things in a detailed manner in fact uh, this is nothing but the entire syllabus of our a uh, uh, both uh, general studies as well as indian administration this is nothing but the entire syllabus if you look at uh, the syllabus this is what the syllabus is all about so first one is uh, the rule of law what is this rule of law what is this rule of law the essence of rule of law is uh, equality before law it is equality before law the essence of rule of law is equality before law before uh, the britishers uh, we never had uh, this uh, concept of rule of law before the british entered into the country we never had the concept of rule of law why because we had only dictatorship in dictatorial regimes there is no rule of law why because whatever the emperor whatever the king would say would be rule of law whatever the king say would be the law you know king had all these powers what are the powers king had legislative powers executive powers as well as judicial powers that is what we call dictatorship in dictatorship all the powers are concentrated in the hands of one person all the powers were concentrated all the powers were concentrated in the hands of a single person and we india never had experienced true democracy or rule of law for almost 5000 years this concept of democracy and rule of law is a modern concept it was not there in earlier times it was not there in earlier times it was a modern concept it was developed in uk and later they introduced it in india also so but again if you look at it here what the british has introduced in india was different from what they had in their own country that is what we must remember here they did not put whatever they had in their country in india in a blind manner india was not a sovereign nation it was a colony so obviously colony subjects will not enjoy the same kind of rights as the citizens of the imperial state so when they introduced rule of law it was only introduced in a very preliminary form it was not there completely so people were never equal during the british regime indians were never treated as equal they are never treated as equal in fact indians understood more about rule of law when they visited uk the kind of rights and the freedoms the people of uk enjoyed in their own country in great britain and indians never had those kind of freedoms the reason why the freedom movement started was when people from india traveled to united kingdom when they traveled uh, to united kingdom they saw the kind of freedoms and rights uh, that the british has enjoyed and they started asking the question why can't we also have the same kind of rights and freedoms that was the origin of freedom movement in india 
they saw the kind of uh, the society that the UK had at that point of time. Even though Britishers introduced uh, this rule of law, it was neither in letter nor in spirit. At least uh, in the present day India, we have rule of law in letter. During the British times, it was not there either in letter or in spirit. We came to know about it mostly from the uh, Britishers rule in their own country. We came to know about rule of law mostly from uh, the Britishers in their own country than what they had introduced in India. In India, uh, you know, they introduced the, the basic uh, rule of law. How did they, what did they do? They replaced, uh, during the Mughal times, what was the administration? During the Mughal times, administration was based on Shariat, Islam personal laws. And what did the Britishers do? They introduced a secular rational administration in India. As part of rule of law, they introduced secular and rational administration. They delinked the religion from administration. That is what they had done, delinking religion from administration. Second one is, uh, they introduced the judiciary as part of rule of law. The essence of rule of law, as we have said, is separation of powers between legislature, executive and judiciary. The essence of rule of law is uh, separation of powers between uh, legislature, executive and judiciary. Legislature is responsible for uh, formulating laws, rules and regulations, executive for implementing them and judiciary for interpretation. That is what we say. Legislature for formulating, executive for implementing and judiciary for interpreting, review. So, to perform this function, British has introduced executive for implementing and judiciary for interpretation. To perform these functions, to perform these functions, British has came out with independent judiciary. They had come out with an institution called the judiciary. Earlier judicial functions were also performed by the king, emperor. And earlier judicial functions were mostly performed by religious heads. They were the ones who interpreted the religious traditions and customs. Now this function is begin, being given to judiciary. If you look at the freedom movement in India, most of uh, the leaders of the freedom movement were lawyers only. Most of them were lawyers only. So that a judicial profession was uh, very attractive during those times. The law profession, legal profession was very, very attractive during those times. So coming back here, if you look at uh, the British rule in India, what do we say? We say that uh, judiciary during the British times, judiciary during the British times was neither independent nor impartial. It was neither independent nor impartial. During the British times, it was neither independent nor impartial. It was not independent because, why it was not independent? Because uh, the Viceroy or Governor General can always uh, uh, veto the decisions of the Supreme Court. Viceroy or Governor General, Viceroy or Governor General can always veto the decisions of the Supreme Court. can veto the decisions of the Supreme Court. It was not independent. It was not impartial. Why it was not impartial? Because Indian judges were not allowed, 
Indian judges were not allowed to pronounce judgments in cases involving Europeans and Britishers. Indian judges were not allowed to pronounce judgments in cases involving Europeans and Britishers. They were not allowed to pronounce judgments in cases involving Europeans and Britishers. Even though inter the introduced judiciary, it was neither independent nor impartial. Next, uh, they introduced a federal form of government. British has introduced a federal form of a government. What did they do as part of this federal form of government? What did they do? British had realized that uh, India being such a vast country, it cannot be governed from a single place. That is what they had realized during their uh, early experience in India. India is uh, such a big country, vast country, it cannot be governed from a single place. They had realized the fact that uh, administrative decentralization is necessary. They had realized the fact that administrative decentralization is necessary to improve efficiency of administration. Administrative decentralization is necessary to improve efficiency of administration. It is necessary to improve the efficiency of administration. Administrative decentralization is necessary. That is the reason why the country was divided into provinces. Administrative decentralization is necessary to improve efficiency of administration. That's why what did they do? They divided the country into various provinces. What were the provinces that were there at that point of time? The Bengal province was there, then Madras, then Bombay, then United Province, then northern provinces. Like this, they had divided the country. They had introduced, you know, they had divided the country into various provinces. Then what did they do? The governor of Bengal province was, Bengal province was declared as the governor general of the entire country also. Governor of Bengal province was made the governor general of the entire country. Under which regulating act? Seventeen? Ninety-three. Eighteen thirteen. Two thousand fifty-two. Ninety-three. Nineteen ninety-three. Okay. I will keep on asking these kind of questions and find out answers to them. Okay? Because this is what they will be asking in your prelims. These are the questions they are asking. Find out the answer and tell me tomorrow. Okay. So, coming back here, that is what they have done. They divided the country into various provinces. Then, what did they do? 1935 Government of India Act had for the first time introduced true federalism in India. 1935 Government of India Act. It had introduced federalism in India. Federal form of government. 1935 Government of India Act introduced a federal form of government in India. How? It had come out with a union list, state list and a concurrent list. Union list, state list and concurrent list. to divide the powers between the federal units, to divide powers between the federal units. 
to divide powers between the federal units. 1935, Government of India Act. And after independence, we continued with the same arrangement. They introduced federal Pama government. Even though it was federal Pama government, uh, India was completely a unitary state only. India was completely a unitary state, even though it was federal form of government, because the governor general or the viceroy had absolute powers. The governor general or the viceroy had absolute powers. It was only a unitary state. They had absolute powers. Governor General or Viceroy had absolute powers. So this is what uh, they had introduced. After independence, uh, we made changes. What are the changes we will study? Again, as part of uh, center-state relations, we will study them. After federal form of government, the next they introduce is, uh, they introduce all of them simultaneously, but uh, we will going, we are going one by one. Next one is parliamentary form of government. Parliamentary form of democracy they had introduced. It was 1853. It was 1853. A regulating Act. 1853 Regulating Act. Uh, that introduced uh, parliamentary form of government in India. Eighteen fifty three regulating act that introduced parliamentary form of government in India. What happened with eighteen fifty three regulating act? It had separated the powers of legislature and executive. It had separated the powers of legislature and executive. And executive. For the first time, legislative and executive powers were separated for the first time. Then from then onwards, slowly, parliamentary democracy was introduced. Then what happened uh, after that, in a slowly, in administration, legislature and executive functions were, you know, slowly, as over a period of time. Then what happened, 1892, Indian Consist Act. What did 1892 Indian Council Act do? It had given representation for Indians in legislative councils. It had given representation for Indians, 1892. It had given representation for Indians in legislative councils. Why? Why? Because it had given representation, representation for Indians in uh, legislative councils for the first time. For the first time, Indians were given representation. Why? Because 1885 Congress Party was formed. 1885 Congress Party came into existence. When Congress had come into existence in 1885, what was the demand of Congress Party? They were not seeking independence or uh, sovereignty. Their demand was that uh, why should only Britishers exploit India? Indians should also be given opportunity. Very noble intention. Okay. From 1885 till 2018, Congress party had the same uh, objective. Okay. Why should only Britishers exploit the country? 1885 Congress party was headed by foreigner. 2018. Again, foreigner. Okay. That is what we study in history. The more the things change, the more they remain the same. Nothing has changed for Congress Party. Okay. Diarchy, it was there. Okay. Now also diarchy is there. Rahul Gandhi is the president and the real powers are with Sonia Gandhi. Okay. 
1885 it was foreigner now one more foreigner and uh, except that uh, sonia gandhi's name is not uh, there in uh, npr national population register from assam okay okay otherwise uh, today news papers you have seen the front line front page headlines 40 lakh uh, uh, names were not there in the register if their names are not there then they are not considered as citizens of the country when they are not citizens of the country what is the difference between a citizens and uh, others you know not every citizen has all the fundamental rights you know there are certain fundamental rights which are only reserved for the citizens of the country rest of the people in the country do not have all the fundamental rights they cannot uh, vote in elections they cannot uh, you know uh, get the benefits of welfare and developmental schemes so coming back here when the british has introduced uh, this parliamentary form of government it was introduced over a period of time 1892 in a in the indian councils act for the first time indians were given representation to participate and discuss but they cannot vote they cannot vote they can participate they can discuss they can debate the legislations the bills introduced in the legislative council but they cannot vote and uh, indians to the legislative legislative council were nominated by only by the british government they were not elected by the people also they were only nominated by the british government they were only nominated by the british government they were not elected and uh, whom did the british nominate the leaders of the princely states were nominated as members of legislative council princely states the leaders the kings and the princes were nominated to legislative council obviously it did not satisfy congress party they wanted you know other indians also to be part of legislative process that was the reason why in 1909 the reforms were introduced 1909 what happened in 1909 two things first they expanded the size of legislative council second elections were held to legislative council and other indians were given other indians were given the opportunity to contest elections era it was not restricted to only princely state members elections were held and uh, those who elected could become members of legislative council from people from nomination to election again uh, otherwise the administrative arrange- arrangement is the same what is it they can discuss and debate but they cannot vote they can discuss and debate they cannot vote and what is the objective what is the what did the british say they wanted you uh, know in, uh, indians to have a responsible government they wanted to teach indians about uh, democracy that is the reason why they said that uh, they were introducing these changes in a very slow and steady manner so that uh, indians can get used to democracy that is what they said then uh, obviously it did not satisfy congress party and then what happened uh, from 1916 16 onwards there was a change in the congress party leadership mahatma gandhi he became the leader of the congress party moderates in congress party were on the decline extremists were on the rise and they were making other demands like at least giving dominion status to india giving indians complete freedom to rule rule their country obviously you know again the british has played their uh, uh, dirty tricks they came out with the 1919 government of india act what is the essence of 1919 government of india act what did they do as part of uh, evolution of parliamentary democracy in 1919 government of india act what did they do 
what did they do? They expanded the scope of parliamentary democracy. Indians were given representation in executive also. Earlier they were only restricted to legislature. They were given representation in executive also. And uh, diarchy was introduced in the provinces. Diarchy, it was introduced in the provinces. Diarchy was introduced in the provinces. this diarchy was introduced in provinces and when they introduced diarchy what is it what is this diarchy in provinces the subjects of the government were divided into two categories transferred subjects and reserved subjects the activities of the government were divided into two categories transferred subjects and reserved subjects and reserved subjects were completely in the hands of the Britishers they were, they were out of bonds for Indians what were reserved subjects security finances and defense and uh, other things everything was part of reserved subjects anything uh, that is critical for uh, British survival in India was part of reserved subjects part of reserved subjects and what were the subjects that were transferred to Indians Indian ministers sanitation rural development urban development little bit of education little bit of health they were transferred to Indians Basically, the objective is to the objective is to pacify the Congress Party and uh, the Freedom Movement. Obviously, in Congress Party, there was a lot of disagreement over uh, this 1919 Government of India Act. Some of the people wanted to join the government and create problems for the British administration by being within the government. Whereas most of others in the Congress party wanted to boycott the government. They did not want to contest elections. Why? Because this 1995 Government of India Act was nothing but a complete eyewash. British was never really transferred. What they said as part of this 1990 Government of India Act was that, of course, in case of reserved subjects, the Indians had absolutely no role to play. Even in case of transferred subjects also, which had Indian ministers, the ultimate power lies with the bureaucracy. The secretary in that particular department can veto the decisions of the minister. Secretary had absolute veto powers. He can veto the decisions of the minister without giving any explanation also. These ICS officers had a huge amount of powers. ICS officers, they can veto the decisions of the ministers. Obviously, this uh, arrangement did not satisfy the freedom fighters. Some of them wanted to collect, uh, the, some of them wanted to contest elections and uh, participate in governance. They were called pro changes in Congress party, and rest of them were no changes. Motilal Nehru and others. So the elections were held and uh, they became ministers at the provincial level. Within a short period of time, they, they realized the fact that Britishers were playing a dirty game with them. They never had any real powers. And immediately what did they do? They resigned. And after that, uh, again, uh, uh, the agitation was started. And what did the British government do? They had sent Simon Commission to discuss about a transfer of power to India, to give dominion status or uh, how to transfer power to India. Again, uh, that is what we study. What we say is that when the government uh, does not want to commit itself, it committees it. So, committees and commissions are basically appointed with the objective of with the objective of delaying the decisions. British has perfected this art. Whenever Congress party would start an agitation, they would appoint a committee or commission. They will say that the committee will look into the problems, the demands of Congress party 
it will discuss them it will analyze it will submit the report on the basis of the report we will take a decision the committee will be given at least 2 300 years time to submit the report so simon commission was appointed it was boycotted by india because simon commission did not have a single member from india so obviously it was boycotted then gandhi started this uh, dandi march and finally in a the second round table conference gandhi attended and after that britishers came out with this 1935 government of india act and what did they do as part of this 1935 government of india act what did they do they introduced as we have said federal form of government and they also abolished the diarchy in provinces and introduced at the central level it was never implemented it was never implemented diarchy was never implemented at the central level and uh, they had come out with various institutions also as part of 1935 government of india act what are the most important institutions that had come into existence as part of 1935 government of india act supreme court first one as a supreme court then rbi reserve bank of india federal uh, the reserve bank at that point of time federal bank of india at that point of time then FPSC Federal Public Service Commission which was later re renamed as UPSC so these institutions had come into existence as part of uh, 1935 government of india act and then elections were held in 1937 congress party came to power in the provinces as well as at the central level and when the second world war started in 1939 when the second world war started in 1939 what happened the british government announced the participation of india in the second world war without consulting the ministers so the ministers had resigned and gandhi started quit india movement once the war had ended the british government started the process of transferring power to india which was completed in 1947 this was what we call the whole history of a constitutional governance in india that started with 1853 and ended with 1947 indian independence act so when you look at uh, the british parliamentary democracy in india they did not introduce completely the parliamentary democracy it was never there in the whole of the british rule in india parliamentary democracy was only introduced in letter but never in spirit in a parliament was never given in a parliament was never given sufficient powers and uh, all the decisions were taken by the governor general all the decisions were uh, taken by the governor general parliament was there it never had any real powers next uh, important you uh, know thing that we talk about here is after a parliamentary democracy they introduced civil services in india the next important uh, thing we have to talk about is civil services in india what did they do as part of civil services in india so what happened uh, as we have said east india company was there and east india company the objective was to maximize revenues from the country when the, they came out with this position of collectors the district collector who were appointed as collectors it was mostly spoils system that means uh, mostly the relatives of uh, relatives of uh, the directors in london they were appointed as collectors relatives of the directors in london were appointed as collectors it was what we call the spoils system s p o i l s spoils system the relatives of the directors were appointed as collectors and uh, what happened since uh, they did not possess any technical technical knowledge of administration they were not successful they were not successful because uh, administration is a technical activity administration is a technical activity and they did not possess any skills in administration 
they did not possess any uh, skills needed for administration. So it impacted the revenues of East India Company. It impacted the revenues of East India Company. They could not maximize the revenues. Then the East India Company realized that uh, they needed a technically qualified personnel. They needed a technically qualified personnel to head these crucial positions. To head these crucial positions. These crucial positions. Then what did they do? They started recruiting people. Ishina company started recruiting people on the basis of a merit through open competitive examinations. They started recruiting people on the basis of merit through open competitive examinations. Through open competitive examinations. Through open competitive examinations. So they introduced modern civil services in India. They introduced this modern MODERN civil services in India. So the civil services in India at that point of time were divided into two categories. Civil services were divided into two categories. They were divided into two categories broadly. What are they? First one is covenanted C O V E N A N T A D covenanted civil services. Second one is non covenanted civil service. Non. What is the meaning of the word uh, covenant? C O V E N A N T. What is the meaning of the word covenant in English? It means an agreement. It means agreement. Covenanted civil services means there was an agreement between the employer and the employee. Agreement between the employer and employee. Agreement between the employer and employee. The employer here is East India Company and the employees are the civil servants. What you call them at that point of time? Company servants, civil servants. What was the agreement related to? Agreement was related to the conditions of service, salary, promotions, pension and other things. Conditions of service, salary, promotions, discipline, pensions, post retirement benefits and so on. And so on. The agreement was between the East India Company and the civil servants, company servants. The agreement was related to these things. So what East India Company wanted? East India Company wanted the best of the talent in the world to work in India. The best of the talent in the world to work in India. That is the reason why in those days Indian civil services were considered the most efficient civil service in the world. Better than the civil services that the British had there in their own country also. They wanted to attract the best of the talent. When can you attract the best of the talent? Only when you give attractive service conditions in terms of salary, pensions and other packages. They wanted to attract the best of the talent. In those days, you know, in those days we are talking about uh, 
in a 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, at that point of time, 250 years back, more than that. In those days, uh, what do we say? In those days, uh, when the Europeans and the British, uh, they wanted to work in India, they would put lot of conditions. Why? Because look at India and look at UK at that point of time. Culture was completely different. Religion different. Language different. Climatic conditions different. Food habits different. Everything is different. For example, a person from North England, which is extremely cold and chilly weather, coming and working in Madras province, extremely hot and humid. Why would he come all the way from North England to work in Madras province? Unless uh, he gets uh, attractive remuneration. He should be getting remuneration which is uh, much higher than what he was getting in his own country. So, what they used to demand is that the first condition of this uh, company civil servants was that they should be paid their salaries only in Indian rupees, not British pounds. In those days, uh, Indian rupee was the strongest currency in the world. Our rupee was the strongest currency in the world. Right now, what is a uh, one pound and a uh, rupee exchange rate? One uh, pound equal to 89 rupees, 88, 89 rupees, 90 rupees. In those days, one rupee equal to 100 pounds. Can you imagine? One rupee equal to 100 pounds. And they would say that, uh, they would say that uh, Indians should be, the these, uh, uh, you know, officers, uh, civil servants demanded that they should be paid only in, in Indian rupees, not in British pounds. And they demanded a minimum salary of 500 rupees per month. In those days, 500 rupees per month means uh, at present uh, equal to the salary of uh, Mukesh Ambani. What is salary of Mukesh Ambani? That Reliance Industries Limited pays. What is salary of Mukesh Ambani? 10 crores. That is only the basic salary. Otherwise, he will be given so many other benefits also. 10 crores annual salary, 10 crores. So, in those days, they would uh, demand these things. And the Asian company had agreed them to pay in Indian rupees, 500 rupees. And what are the other service conditions uh, that they were given? They do not have to work in India for a very long period of time. If they work in India for, say, 10 years, that was more than enough. They can go back to UK, go back to UK and work there and they will be paid pension for the rest of their lifetime for working only for 10 years. They were paid pension also. Again, the objective is to attract the best of the talent. Covenanted civil services. Top services were what we call covenanted civil services. The agreement was there. Then the other one is non-covenanted civil services. Non-covenant means there was no agreement between the employer and employee. And for these non covenant civil services, you know, Indians were given opportunity to work in these non covenant civil services. Who were East India Company required a huge army of clerks to work with the East India Company. Clerk and other jobs, you know, cooks, then gardeners, servants, they were part of non covenant civil services. There was no agreement between East India Company and uh, these employees. They can be removed at any point of time without giving any explanation also. Their salaries were also very less. There was no pension also. That is what we called non covenanted civil services. So, they introduced as part of civil services in India, covenanted and non covenanted civil services. Later, after some point of time, they had abolished this system. They introduced a new system. What is it? In place of covenanted and non covenanted civil services, they had come out with another new system with three different uh, services. Three different services. First one is uh, All India Services. All India Services. What were All India Services? ICS and IPS. 
Indian Civil Service and Indian Police Service. IPS, uh, nobody knows exactly when IPS came into existence. It was around uh, 1910 for the first time this rank of IPS was introduced. 1910. ICS and IPS. That was the first uh, All India Service. Second one is Provincial Civil Services. Second one is Provincial uh, Civil Services. Provincial Civil Services. What were these Provincial Civil Services? Like what we have at present, State Services. At the state level, you have uh, Group A, Group B, Group 1, Group 2 Services, Provincial Services. The third one they introduced was the subordinate services. Subordinate services. Subordinate services means this group 3 and group 4 services. Pewns, gardeners, cooks, all these what we call subordinate services, clerks, all of them. That is what they had introduced. And uh, the examination for all India services, they were conducted in London. The examinations were conducted in London. And uh, it was considered the toughest examination in the world at that point of time. Toughest competitive examination in the world. The civil service examination was uh, the toughest examination in the world at that point of time. The question paper was set by professors from uh, Oxford and Cambridge universities, <coughs> not a partner university, okay. okay, Oxford and Cambridge universities, the question paper was set. They were tested in uh, all the uh, things, they were tested in polity, economy, philosophy, psychology, administration. Only graduates from Oxford and Cambridge universities could clear this examination very very tough not from graduates from Patna University graduates from Patna University what do they do they only join politics and become chief ministers Lala Prasad Yadav okay. in those days you know they were very tough because Britishers wanted the most intelligent people to be there in civil services the examination process was very tough then what happened? Initially, only Europeans and Britishers were allowed to take this examination. Later, later Indians were also allowed to take the examination. Even the Indians were allowed, the representation of Indians was very less. Why? Because the age limit was 19 years. 19 years age limit to take the examination. 19 years. And they had to go to London to take the examination and take the examination which was very tough. So obviously, it was almost impossible for Indians to clear the examination. Then they increased the age limit to 21 years. And uh, 21 years was the maximum age to take the examination, 21 years. That was the maximum age limit to take the examination. Now we have, what is the age limit? At the state level, especially for a group, uh, a yeah, group B services at the state level in a recruitment age is uh, around 80 years retirement age is 60 years retirement age is 60 years recruitment there is no limit ok there is no limit every state government has uh, increased the recruitment in some of the states it is 45 years also you get into services next day you will retire also Sir, that is what we do. In those days, 21 years was the upper age limit to take the examination. Then what happened, you uh, know, again Congress party agitated, saying that uh, we should also exploit the country. And Britishers have accepted it and the examinations were conducted simultaneously in India also. FPSC, Federal Public Service Commission came into existence to conduct examinations in India also. FESA, Federal Public Service Commission, it had come into existence to conduct examinations in India also. 
and after independence FPSC was renamed as UPSC UPSC it was renamed as UPSC after independence we made so many changes to the examination process which we shall be studying later so this is what they had introduced civil services next major change that the British has introduced in India was the district administration district administration the next major change that they had introduced the district administration as part of the district administration what do we say before Britishers were there in India what kind of administration was there in the Mughal provinces in the Mughal administration at the top you had the emperor who had absolute powers in the Mughal administration at the top he had emperor who had absolute powers and he had the support of the council of ministers support of the council of ministers then the empire was divided into various provinces empire was divided into various provinces at present what we call them as the states it was divided into various provinces each province was headed by a governor it was headed by a governor who were appointed as governors normally the sons of the emperor were appointed as governors sons for example uh, Aurangzeb was uh, the governor of Bengal province sorry Deccan province Aurangzeb was the governor of Deccan province he was uh, the governor of Deccan province the sons of the emperor were appointed as governors and uh, provinces were further divided into military districts the provinces were further divided into military districts these provinces were further divided into military districts and they were known as subhas s u b h a s subhas military districts and uh, these uh, districts uh, were headed by munasabdars they were headed by munasabdars munasabdars they were headed by munasabdars again they were appointed by the they were appointed by the governor the Musabdars were appointed by the governor. They were appointed by the governor. In your prelims, these kind of questions are routinely asked. All these questions are routinely asked in your prelims. Part of history, you cannot say that uh, they were discussed in our uh, polity classes, so we will not answer them. Okay. So you have to answer any other questions. Okay. So, and then what was so special about these military districts these munsabdars had all the powers unto themselves they had legislative powers they had executive powers they also had judicial powers they had legislative powers they had executive powers they also had judicial powers legislative executive and judicial powers not only that they maintained their own army they maintained their own army what they are expected to do they must collect land revenue they are expected to collect revenue, land revenue and keep a certain portion with them for to maintain army and keep a certain portion to maintain army rest of the money would be sent to the governor and governor would send it back to the 
emperor. Rest of the money would be sent to the governor and the governor would send it back to the emperor. That is the administrative and financial arrangement during the Mughal times. And not only that, these the Munsab Dars, they are expected to provide the services of the army to the emperor as and when the emperor demanded it. They are expected to provide the services of their army to the emperor. They are expected to provide the services of their army to the emperor as and when the emperor demanded. So, when the Mughals were fighting all these wars, who fought all these wars? The emperor had his own, had his own set of army, but more importantly, the army maintained by these Munsab Das always came to the help of the emperor. That is the reason why if you look at uh, Mughal Empire, maximum wars were fought uh, by Rajputs, you know, on behalf of the Mughal Emperor, Rajputs. For example, if you look at uh, Shivaji, you know, Shivaji army was headed by a Muslim, whereas Aurang, you know, Aurangzeb army was headed by a Hindu. So much for uh, Hindu versus Muslim conflicts. Because Rajputs were the ones who were extremely powerful as part of uh, uh, as part of the Mughal Empire, Mughal Empire, and uh, the emperor would give them all kinds of facilities. You know, they were asked to maintain their army, they were asked to collect their revenues, they were asked to dispense justice, they were asked to legislate uh, for uh, those areas. They had absolute powers. They had absolute powers. And what happened, uh, this is one of the most important reasons for the downfall of Mughal Empire. Why? Because these uh, Munsabdars and the governors were loyal to the emperor as long as the emperor was strong. They knew that uh, if they had revolted, emperor would uh, punish them severely. They had revolted. That is the reason why they had more fear than respect for the emperor. What happened after the death of Aurangzeb in 1707? The later Mughals did not command the same kind of fear. And all these uh, provincial governors as well as these uh, Musabdars uh, declared independence. Why? Because for all practical purposes they were independent. For all practical purposes. They had maintained their own army. They had uh, their own uh, legal system, they had uh, their own, uh, uh, you know, judicial system and everything. So they declared independence. That resulted in the disintegration of the Mughal Empire. That is why we say that uh, this, uh, the strength of the Mughal Empire has uh, turned out to be its uh, major weakness also. What was the strength of Mughal Empire? Centralized despotism. It was their major weakness also. Why? Because when the Mughal emperor had become weak, it immediately resulted in the disintegration of the Mughal empire. How, how long did it take for the disintegration of Mughal empire? 50 years. By 1757, there was no Mughal empire as such. By 1757, by 1857, the rule of the Mughal emperor was restricted to only Red Fort. Red Fort. Beyond that, he did not command any respect also. The great Mughal Empire in it had disintegrated so fast. So fast. Why? Because the strength had turned out to be its major weakness also. It had turned out to be its major weakness. The moment the emperor had become weak, all of them declared independence. They stopped sending money to the emperor. It immediately resulted in the collapse of the empire because the empire did not have any finances. They stopped sending money. That is where the Mughal empire had uh, major problems. So coming back here, this is what the uh, uh, administrative arrangement in uh, Mughal empire. 
as we have said the Britishers uh, initially in the Bengal province continued with the same arrangement initially they continued with the same arrangement after some point of time as I said uh, they were not satisfied with this arrangement why because they were not getting the desired revenues from the districts they were not getting the desired revenues and there was a lot of pressure on the directors in uh, India to show profits from their counterparts in London. So what did the Britishers do? They had replaced uh, this Mughal administration with uh, their own revenue administration. These military districts, these military districts were uh, replaced with uh, what we called revenue districts. The military districts were replaced with revenue districts and uh, they had appointed a, an official to collect the revenue known as collector of revenue. Later came to be known as district collector. District collector. So the district administration which they had introduced at that point of time continued even after independence also. It has continued even after independence also. We continued with the same district administration with the same position called a district collector. That is the reason why after independence we say that uh, this term district collector is a misnomer. It is a misnomer. Why? Because after independence, what is the most important policy decision we have taken? We have abolished agricultural income tax. We have abolished agricultural income tax. Why? Because farmers were ruthlessly exploited by every regime for 5000 years. Because till that point of time, the only source of revenue for the government was land revenue. They used to charge one fourth to one third, 25 percent to 33 percent. So the government had taken the decision that they would not impose any tax on agricultural income. Then what is the role of collectors then? The position itself had come into existence to maximize revenue collections. When they are not collecting the revenue, now that agricultural income tax is abolished, what are they doing now? What are they doing now? What are they doing? They are not doing anything. Don't try to cook up stories. You know, you know this uh, district collector is the most useless person. Okay. They don't do anything. Of course, we will study what are the functions of district collector and we will mention hundreds of functions. And you will be fearing also after we become collector, this is what we are expected to do you will have fear also. We say that the district collector is responsible for everything uh, that happens in the district. You know, as a collector, you know, you know, he is responsible for maintenance of land records. As a magistrate, he is responsible for maintenance of land order. As the chief electoral officer of the district, he is responsible for, for conducting elections right from panchayat bodies to the parliament. And as chief development officer of the district, he is responsible for implementing the developmental schemes of the governments, both the central and state governments. As chief coordinator in the district, he is responsible for ensuring coordination between all the departments in the district. And then uh, as a chief uh, of uh, the district disaster management authority, he is responsible for disaster management also. And uh, as the chief protocol officer of the district, uh, he is responsible for all protocol functions of the district. That is what we say. And you will be you will be already having fear after we become collectors, this is what we are expected to do. Think about it again. Can you perform those functions or not? Don't worry. Because all those illustrious people who got into services before you, they don't know that they have to perform any of these functions also. So you also don't have to fear about those things. Only thing is that in the examination you have to talk about the changing role of district administration since independence. You have to write beautifully about all these things. 
how the district collector is excellently performing all these functions. Okay, that is what happened uh, with the district administration. Next thing that we have said they introduced was local self governments. Local self governments. And what did they do as part of local self governments? It was uh, Lord Ripon, who is known as the father of local self governments in India. Lord Ripon, who is known as the father of LSDs in India, local self governments in India. What did he do? He introduced local self governments. Okay. Okay. They were there in India before that also. There is a panchayat. They were there in India before that also in the villages. What he had done? He had given certain powers for panchayat bodies. The traditional authority of panchayats was transformed into legal authority. Traditional authority was transformed into legal authority. Certain powers were given to local self governments in rural as well as in urban areas. In rural as well as in urban areas. In rural as well as urban areas. That is what he had done in rural as well as urban areas. Certain powers were transferred to local cell governments. Of course, what happened after that? The next governor generals and viceroys who came after him, they did not give much importance to local cell governments. They did not give any importance to local cell governments. The other governor generals and viceroys who came after Lord Ripon, they did not give any importance to local cell governments. They preferred a bureaucratic rule at the local level. They preferred bureaucratic rule. That is, uh, they preferred to rule with the district collectors. They preferred to rule with the district collectors than, than with the people elected representatives. Than with the people elected representatives. So the experiment was not successful. It was not successful. The experiment was not successful. Local cell governments was not successful. Experiment was not successful. And uh, the district administration continued till independence. The rule of the district collector, the rule of the district collector continued till independence. After independence also it continued till 1992. Till 1992, we did not have any local cell governments in India till 1992. We had real local cell governments only after the passage of 73rd and 74th amendments. We had a real local cell governments only after the passage of 73rd and 74th amendments. We will discuss again all of them as part of rural development and urban development. Next, after local cell governments, the next thing that British has introduced was secretariat administration. Secretariat administration. What did they do? As part of secretary administration, they came out with uh, important institutions like uh, central secretariat, cabinet secretariat, important institutions like uh, central secretariat, cabinet secretariat, and uh, prime minister's office. and PMO. But during British times the names were different. 
after independence we change the names the names were different after independence we change the names but we continued with the same institutions we continued with the same institutions then uh, as part of our analysis we will discuss about uh, what kind of reforms are required in these institutions also don't worry we will be discussing about all these things the entire syllabus is about only all these things even if you are not able to write uh, what i am saying now don't worry because uh, you'll be writing the same things in the next one month i'll be repeating repeating myself every day in the next one month okay so if you write everything tomorrow onwards you don't find anything new so that is the reason why i am making sure deliberately that you will not be able to write anything okay so don't worry about all these things okay we'll be discussing in fact do you want me to give uh, the handwritten notes yes yes okay no problem you know so you don't want me to be a dictator who dictates you want me to dictate things in the class or you want me to give the handwritten notes so that uh, both very good what will you do what will you do this is what indian mentality you want everything and you end up with nothing okay we always try to be too smart you know that is where the problem with indians you know so which one do you want you want me to give the notes for all the lectures yes you don't want uh, the notes you want to write it in the class your own individual efforts very good let us see at that also <laughs> by tomorrow the end of the class there will be unanimous decision that uh, that you want only hand it and notes only thing is that what is the reason of you uh, know dictating things in the class you have to write also you have to practice writing also in the ups examination in 3 hours you are writing in your general studies you are writing 20 questions in optional you are writing 19 questions when will you practice writing at home do you write at least every day for 1 hour are you writing i am asking a question you know as usual you will be looking at me and i will be looking at you i will get you that is what we always say your preparation is incomplete if you are not writing for one hour every day that's what i always said also if you are not eating or if you are not sleeping i am not bothered but if you are not writing it means that you are not preparing for this examination every day you have to write for one hour why because you know you have to develop these abilities these writing abilities do not come to people naturally not all of you are uh, like uh, you know the great writers you know not all of you the jawala nehru he would write excellently except that nobody could understand you know he would speak so fluently again except that nobody could understand okay not all of you have that kind of communication skills you have to develop uh, the writing skills you have to develop and you have to do you know you have to write for 3 hours because uh, clearing the preliminary examination uh, upsc will not give you any gold medal preliminary examination is not uh, an examination uh, of selection it is only an examination of elimination so to get yourself selected what is required is you need very good writing skills the main examination so we will see what can be done if you want a hand written notes i'll give it to you or if you want me to dictate i will dictate whatever it you want i will do it that is the problem with democracy 
when you give real choices to the people they don't know how to make use of these opportunities that is the reason why india only needs a dictatorship okay i will decide whether to dictate or you know whether to dictate or discuss okay in the true tradition of dictatorship i will decide okay. so coming back here that is what we have said part of uh, in a secretary administration then uh, we also introduced uh, british also introduced uh, budgets and financial administration they introduced budgets and financial administration so what did they do as part of this uh, they introduced the general budgets general budgets they also introduced the railway budget till recently we had separate budgets for railways as well as general budget only last year we had merged railway budget with general budget they had introduced railway budgets as well as general budgets they had also introduced uh, these accounting systems as well as auditing systems accounting and auditing systems they also introduced accounting and auditing systems they introduced accounting and auditing systems they also introduced uh, institutions like cag comptroller and auditor general of india cag then uh, they also introduce this committee systems in parliament committee systems in parliament public accounts committee came into existence during british times committee systems in parliament so this is what they have done as part of financial administration then we will discuss about uh, what are the changes that have taken place after independence also in a financial administration and the last one did we mention what is the last one did we, is it over this is the last okay so this is what we say about uh, impact of british rule on indian administration so what we say is that uh, british had introduced so many things but they were never implemented either in letter or in spirit they were never implemented either in letter or in spirit after independence what we have done we have made significant changes to everything right from uh, right from the concept of rule of law to parliamentary form of government to federal system to civil services to district administration to secretariat administration to local self governments and to financial administration one thing we must remember again as we keep on saying is that when the british has introduced all these things their objective was not to maximize welfare of people or to ensure the growth and development of the country their objective was only to exploit the country so all the institutions that they have introduced in india they were highly exploitative in the nature and after independence what do we say we continued with the same institutions that is what exactly second administrative reforms commission in its report to say it says that 21st century india 21st century india is still ruled by 19th century rules and regulations that were introduced by the britishers that is the reason why our administrative structures are still exploitative in nature that is the reason why our political structures have no accountability towards citizens and that is the reason why our entire syllabus is all about how to reform our political and administrative structures political structures in the form of legislature executive and judiciary political structures in the form of union and state governments political structures in the form of the local self governments and administrative structures in the form of Uh, this uh, civil services central secretariat cabinet secretariat pmo and other administrative organizations that is the reason why our syllabus is divided into polity and governance that is what they do so this is where i think uh, you know we can stop it here for today and tomorrow we will uh, get into 
the core of uh, the syllabus tomorrow we will start with the constitution after independence what happened we will talk about uh, how the constitution was framed we will talk about uh, the important value premises of our constitution we will talk about uh, constitutionalism if we have to describe uh, the entire syllabus of our syllabus entire uh, syllabus in a single word it is constitutionalism for every question you start uh, your answer with constitutionalism and end with constitutionalism that is what we will be discussing tomorrow right. and for whatever we have discussed today you know the basic study material is uh, you can read uh, you know this book is there indian administration by you know rajni goel and arora this you have to study both for your public administration as well as polity governance papers the most important book indian public administration by rajni goel and arora you can also study this uh, lakshmikanth indian polity in lakshmikanth you have in uh, you know, a some topics the initial topics about uh, the evolution of uh, british rule in india wherein he talks about all these acts from 1773 to 1947 all these acts you have to so tomorrow we will uh, discuss the rest of the things